Hi there, I'm Jonathan Fields, and this is Good Life Project. My guest today is John Durant, who's the author of a really fascinating book called The Paleo Manifesto. He's also the founder of uh, a movement in New York City, Barefoot Running, sort of a, the whole paleo and ancestral approach to living, a person who studied um, evolutionary psychology at Harvard, and he lives in a way that most people in a big city don't live. We're going to go deep into that, why he does it, and why it may be a good idea for you to explore it as well. I'll just be hanging out with you. Great to be here. Thanks so for having me. We had, like, I just like threw in like probably five massively loaded phrases, <laughs> all in like one quick intro. Um, let's kind of dive right into it. We're hanging out in New York City, right? right? Um, your average person sleeps around, works a day job, it's almost entirely sedentary, lives in an apartment, a nice little cube. A cave. People, yeah. people tease me for being a caveman. But it's people in big cities like New York City who actually are the ones who live in Explain concrete Explain this. So deconstruct caves. this to me. So the basic idea behind paleo ancestral health is there's a mismatch between our primal biology and how we live today. And a lot of health problems are the, are the result of that. That's the basic overview. Um, people have this conception, though, that a couple million years ago, million years ago, People were unhealthy. They their lives were nasty, poor, brutish, and short, um, hairy, dumb, violent. Um, and the reality is, is we were like any other species, well adapted to our habitat. We um, life was dangerous, but we were actually fairly healthy, um, particularly through adulthood. Okay. Um, and so it's just applying that concept to how we live today. Okay. So here's the first red flag that comes up for me. And I know like a lot of people watching this and listening to this are going to have the same red flag. Right. How do we know? Like, so, so, and this is, I think, one of the big pushbacks against anything that, that has the word paleo in it these days or ancestral, which right. is, is that, you know, there's sort of like there are health claims and, and this is how things affect physiology. But I think where a lot of people have a lot of resistance is this idea that um, we want to, eat and move and live the way that people did, you know, like a long, long, long time ago. And we know that they were better off then. So the question is, do we really know? And, and how? Well, the, let's actually step back from humans for a moment, because okay. it's always the most controversial when you talk okay. about people. <laughs> if, you, if you go to any zoo and, and you talk to the zookeepers, the basic approach they take is... Um, mimic the natural habitat of the species and combine that with modern medical technology. And it's uncontroversial. They don't call it paleo. They don't use the word paleo. They don't use the word ancestral. Mm -hmm. They don't, they may talk about evolution a little bit, but it's just kind of, they, they don't have studies, tons of studies telling them that it's best for a Western lowland gorilla to eat an herbivorous diet but they know that that's what gorillas eat in the wild, and so that's probably what they're best adapted to, and so they try to mimic it as closely mm -hmm. as possible. You suddenly get to humans, and nobody can disagree. Nobody can agree. Is it that we don't have enough fiber in our diet, or do we fat, low fat, high fat, Atkins, veganism, uh, and so given that existing confusion, this we can use paleo as a starting point. So how do we know? How do we know? Um, you can look at uh, skeletal remains from the Paleolithic. Uh, humans in the late Paleolithic were taller, had stronger bone density, fewer signs of disease on their bones, um, better dentition than the farmers that immediately followed when we started farming and living in cities. Mm -hmm. Actually, the um, sort of the memory of the in the Bible of the Garden of Eden and being expelled from the Garden of Eden, that's been interpreted by a lot of scholars as basically a memory of life. Life was good as foragers or as hunter-gatherers in the wild or um, in a garden in, 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 in that case. And basically, we do something wrong. We eat a plant we're not supposed to eat. And then life, you get expelled from the Garden of Eden and the curse for Adam and eat for Adam is that he's going to have to be a farmer and he's going to have to eat a lot of bread by the sweat of his brow. And the curse for Eve is childbirth will become more painful and dangerous. Men will come to dominate you. And basically life's going to suck for a while. <laughs> so that's sort of the, the memory. So we know that these earlier folks had 
pretty good teeth, we're tall, we're strong, and, and there's no indication that traditional peoples have things like diabetes and obesity, chronic right. conditions like that. So, and, and I guess also, you know, we can't go back in time. So, so right. we look at indicators and markers. But, you know, to me, and, and it's interesting because, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time re-examining my lifestyle, what, how I move, how I think, how I feel in my body over the last couple of years especially. And, you know, if you, you look at it just on an individual level, but also on a societal level, you know, like what's been happening. And then you look at the lifestyle evolution just in the last probably couple decades. Right. You know, I, I think it's not a big leap to say, okay, maybe you don't have to just, you know, go totally down the paleo lifestyle rabbit hole. But at the same time, the way we're doing things now ain't working. Right. It's broken. <laughs> so something's not right about, it, like, this system. Yeah, and, for, and I, don't, I don't usually say this, but I don't really care whether a ton of people end up adopting paleo or even using the word paleo. Yeah. For a lot of people, they can be healthy simply by removing sugar and processed foods from their diet and moving more, and getting more sleep and having good personal relationships. And you don't necessarily need the Paleolithic to tell you that um, no. or to figure that out. But if that's, you know, there are a lot of people where that doesn't quite go far enough. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. So you can think of the Paleolithic not as the truth, capital T, but as a starting point for really good hypotheses for figuring out health problems and things right. like that. So. Tell me where this all comes into your life. What's, this, what's the story behind the story here that makes you, kind of drops you into this world that says, I need to live in a, in a, a really different deliberate way than most of the people around me? The, um, it, it was, I had studied some evolutionary psychology in college, but it was more academic and theoretical. I moved to New York City, start working for a consulting firm, first full-time desk job, and like a lot of people, work hard, play hard, my health takes a dive, I'm drinking a lot, I'm eating terrible food, yada, yada, yada. Um, but for me, it wasn't about losing weight. I didn't want to just lose weight, I wanted to feel healthier. So I came across an evolutionary approach, it clicked, I tried it, got good results. The, what has actually been difficult for me, this is the real behind the scenes stuff, is I, during the release of my book, it, it was one of the most unhealthy moments of my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. my, I talk a lot about habitat and the importance of your habitat, your apartment, your home, your office, your car, wherever you spend time. Um, and I had to move twice within six months in New York. Um, I still had boxes that were just stacked up yeah. in my room that I hadn't unpacked. My workout routines got totally randomized and, and fell out of my rhythm. I wasn't getting enough sun. It was just, so I'm out there talking to people about the benefits of all this stuff. And in my own personal life, I was totally destroying myself. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> which is so interesting, right? Because that's one, so I've been an entrepreneur in uh, the fitness industry for probably 15 years. And one of the things that's happened, and I've, I've been through this cycle numerous times myself. Yeah. You know, I've been teaching yoga, I've been teaching meditation, when my dirty little secret was I was in a window where I was doing neither. You know, for whatever reason, maybe I'm too far down the entrepreneurship rabbit hole, maybe we're launching something, maybe I'm just disconnected from it, and it's, you know, too much my business, not enough my practice. Um, that happens so much with people who become, and I saw this with, with fitness professionals and with yoga teachers, is that one of the hardest things for them to do is actually hang on to their practice and their lifestyle. The more they become actually popular as professionals in that space, because um, the demands of that are so much, and they want to get the word out, they want to help a lot of people, but at the same time, it takes them so away from the very essence of what they're preaching. Yeah, it, uh, and, you know, when I'm going into a CrossFit box or whatever, I I sort of feel on, you know, because I write about CrossFit yeah. and, and, and that's one of the things I'm talking about. 
But then it's like, oh no, I have to perform at a certain level, you know, because now I'm supposed to be, you know, the、right. spokesman in、yeah. some capacity for the way that it works. And,、um, and yeah, I totally get. I mean, <laughs> well, I owned a yoga center, you know, like a large studio in New York City for seven years, and I can probably count on one hand the number of students in seven years who saw me practice there. Because it was, I couldn't just do my practice there. Yeah, you know, like the, I knew the moment I stepped out onto the floor, there was an expectation from every other person in the room. And if I was like burned, if I was just having a bad day, if I just wanted to go inside and like stay in child's pose for half the practice, I felt like I couldn't do it. I couldn't honor what I really needed out of it. Just、yeah. perform at whatever level I needed to, because like there were eyes on me the whole time. And it's such an interesting dynamic because it should be anything but that. And、maybe that was even just me. Maybe it wasn't the truth. Right. But you, it's still fascinating how you feel that still. Yeah. Well, the one of the things I've realized is the importance of div- whenever you feel down or unmotivated, low energy, whatever, is finding things that are healthy that get you back into a good mood.、Mm-hmm. Because a lot of people can get into. Smoking cigarettes or having another cup of coffee、right. and something that's very transitory, and gets you sort of hooked in a negative feedback loop. And so the challenge is finding things that make you f- like remotivate, reenergize, but put you in a positive direction. One of the things I really love because it makes me feel good and it doesn't require a lot of discipline or effort.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, because if you're in a low motivated state,、right. you need something that is、yeah. is hot and cold exposure and going to the Russian baths. Have you、huh. ever been to the Russian baths here? No, I have so many friends who like have told me about them, but I and I've lived in the city forever. I've never actually been. It's it's thirty five bucks. You can go for all day or as long as you want, and it's saunas, steam rooms, cold pools, and you alternate between the two.、Right. Um, I have a chapter on thermoregulation、right. in my book, and. You, I really come to love the cold, the cold pool.、Um, so it's, a,、uh, it's like a reset that, button. Yeah, let's go down that rabbit hole a little、yeah. bit because I know you do write about it. Yeah, what's actually going on there? So you,、um, there, there are a few things going on. The, the, the first thing is that we, I mean, we, we lead temperature controlled existences. You know, from one habitat to the next, and and if you just go anywhere in the world. Where there's not heat or air conditioning, you have much more temperature variation、um, throughout just day and night.、Mm-hmm. So one thing that's happening is you're getting the constriction and relaxation of your blood vessels, and that seems to help with inflammation a lot. So you, so going back to the Spartans, you know they excavate these old uh, uh, buildings in Sparta around their gymnasium, and they would have saunas. Um, for for after their、mm-hmm. their workouts,、um, and you still have professional athletes doing that today.、Uh, hygiene was a huge reason that probably isn't as important today,、mm-hmm. but the women in a lot of cultures, women would give birth in saunas、mm-hmm. because it was sterile, it was isolated、uh, from other people,、um, and there was usually water available. They wouldn't have the heat on full blast, right?、Um, And after burials, some cultures would everybody would have to go in to the sauna or the steam room as a religious ritual, but it it also、um, it it also helps deal with、uh, infections. And then an, another reason is that there a lot of cultures when people were sick, they would go into the sauna or the steam room. Right. And this is more speculative. Because、um, people, the Scandinavians and the Japanese study this topic a lot because they love this type of thing, but a lot of cultures don't study it.、Um, a fever is an adaptive response by the body to fight off infections. It's elevated internal body temperature, and so there is. Some people think that by going into a hot place,、um, it it makes it a little bit easier for your body to. Raise its its internal core temperature. Now your body's dynamic, and so you're sweating and you're doing things to、right. reduce the temperature in your body. So it's not as if you can just sort of permanently raise, or, or even temporarily raise、um, your your core temperature. But、um, 
it may help with essentially sort of encouraging a fever to help fight off the yeah. sickness. So it's so interesting, right? Because one, of, I've, I've had this love-hate relationship with hot yoga or Bikram yoga. Yeah. And I've um, had conversations. At one point, I was having conversations with like the leading researcher on exercise and extreme heat. You know, Is this really good? Is this really bad? Are the claims legit? And I was trying to figure out what it was about Bikram that made it so unique. And it's it's not just the heat, it turns out. You know, because if it's hot, like you said, our body temperature is raised, but then we sweat, the sweat evaporates, and it cools us. We have right. that system built into us. Right. But the thing that changes the game with that is that then you pump in high levels of humidity, and sweat no longer evaporates. Right. So it effectively shuts down your cooling system in your body. So your internal temperature actually can't jack back down anymore. You know, and in some ways that can that can be good because it kills pathogens or it does, you know, it can create other beneficial effects. But also, yeah, do you hit a point where that's actually <laughs> harmful? Yeah, there's a reason why your body right tries it to has that mechanism. Yeah, you know? um, so it's it's kind of fascinating, sort of like looking at those things and looking at the claims, and then looking at where's the where's the line between you know like psychological torture and like actual benefit to your right. body and right. um, and sort of like how you handle that. Well, the, so the, a heuristic that I use for not just temperature, but uh, cold, you know, hot and cold exposure, but eating frequency and movement and things like that is just looking at the the amount of variation that would have been typical in our ancestral habitat. You know, and you get way more temperature fluctuation throughout the day. You get way more variation in surfaces. You get way more variability in the types of foods that people would eat and the times that they would eat them. Um, and and so that's sort of, if, if it's roughly within the parameters of what we did for a long time, mm-hmm. I figure that's probably safe. And then if you go outside of it, outside of those parameters, then you better make it brief. Um, right. You brought up um, this word, inflammation. Yeah. Um, which I'm hearing more and more and more um, as the source of so much. Deconstruct this. What you mean by inflammation a little bit, and what's yeah, what's going on around? I mean, this? I'm not, I'm not the, I'm not your biochemistry guy who's right. going to have a, a perfect biochem explanation. But um, you know, when when there are parts of the body that are uh, have have damaged tissues um, the, the the body um, tries to repair those tissues and it, it could be um, you twist an ankle and your there's inflammation from your ankle swelling up well that's actually adaptive and good because inflammation there is is your your body, um, attempting to demobilize something damaged tissue that shouldn't be damaged anymore, mm-hmm. but right. So, but what's happening is that we're doing things to our body so that it's always in a period of of inflammation, of chronic stress, of eating an excess amount of um, omega omega sixes, omega six fatty acids, which have a, a pro inflammatory effect on the body mm-hmm. that. Is comes from our grain-based diets, from wheat, corn, and soy, um, uh, releasing cortisol from drinking too much coffee or staying up too late and having poor sleep. So we're we're always in this state of flight, fight or flight mm. state, and and it's extremely damaging. Yeah, and, and and what's I mean, it seems like the more and more research that's coming a lot of out of integrated medicine or you know, complementary medicine is really identifying sort of like systemic, sy- systemic inflammation. Yeah, as and autoimmune this, conditions. Right, so. as this just, you know, it's like there's inflammation, there's autoimmune response to it, and it's manifesting in so many different forms of pain or disease or disability throughout the body. Um, and it's funny, you know, like Mark Hyman is one of the leading voices in that space. You know, basically says, you know, like the, 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 it's not about the, the disease, like the, all the names that we give everything, it's just we're naming symptoms. Right. Rather than sort of going on. And again, I'm not a doctor and I'm yeah. not, a, you know, in the clinical world. But um, the notion that a lot of the things, so, you know, we're in a time where non specific pain, pervasive like never yeah. before. I know I've experienced it in my own body, you know, or where, you know, chronic disease or inflammation, stuff like that that isn't all that treatable by 
traditional means a lot. I mean, I, it's almost, and maybe I'm at a point in my life also, in my late 40s, where a lot of people my age are feeling this. Well, and you start to realize that pills and surgery... It, it's not fixing ...doesn't it. address it. Yeah, and, and, maybe, and of course, like, no knock on mainstream medicine. There right. are times where <laughs> that's the appropriate right. response. Right, right. Well, it, it, if, it, if you have an acute health problem, gunshot wound, broken arm, you have a heart attack, um, you know, complications during pregnancy, our medical system is fantastic. It's terrific. Um, but it's all these chronic health conditions that you can't cure or reverse with, with pills and surgery. Yeah, so, so that gets back to lifestyle, right. nutrition, what you put in your body, the way you move your body. Um, sleep, you mentioned, you brought up, which is kind of counterintuitive because um, you know, if these are all triggers for inflammation, which then becomes sort of like the potential source for a lot of stuff, right. um, and then you want to reverse your way out of it, you know, what's kind of fascinating is it pulls back to these simple things we've been taught as a kid, the difference being, we've always been taught like sleep matters, nutrition matters, movement matters, but it's doing it that's hard, right? It's doing it, and then also I think where a lot of the confusion comes is doing it right. Yeah, you know, because okay, so we, nutrition matters. Like we've been taught, there's nobody I know that hasn't been taught as a kid like you are what you eat. Right. Right. But then we go through a period, you know, at least in the United States, where it's like, well, here's what you need to do. And then enough research comes out and says, no, that was wrong. Here's what you need to do. And then 10 years later, oh, no, 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 that was wrong. Here's what you need to do. And it seems like we're at a place now where you know, there's been a lot of advice for a lot of time, and we're sicker than ever before. And now, so you get things like paleo or like you know, various approaches to nutrition that are more based in one of the cores across almost all these things is removing gluten and wheat yep. and grains. So. Talk to me a little bit more about this and, and why you believe that this is sort of like the right approach. I would love to destroy the diet book industry. <laughs> I, I, I would think if, if paleo or an evolutionary approach or it would be a great success if one day we don't have a thousand different diet books coming out every year like hawking different miscellaneous, you know, yeah. arbitrary lists of, of foods. Um, I think, I, th I hope that eventually we will converge on a rough set of guidelines that um, make sense given our evolutionary heritage and are supported by science, uh, by properly controlled studies and things like that. Um, and, and I think it's roughly going to look like this. It's roughly going to be um, avoid a heavily industrial diet processed foods, sugar, vegetable oils, things like that. And then be careful of a heavily grain-based diet. Um, concentrating your diet in wheat, corn, soy, and a few other staple cereal grains. And, and then there's going to be a lot of stuff around the edges. Eating nose to tail, fermented foods, um, eating frequency, fasting, things like that. But, but I think those are actually going to be the big... Um, what I, th what I hope, the sort of the simple stuff. Yeah. What's, for those who, I know there's been a lot of written, a lot of shared about this over the last few years, but for those who sort of haven't, don't know the basic argument around grains, yeah. lay it out a little bit. So grains are a type of seed. And when most, pe most people hear the word seed, they think of sunflower seeds and things like that. When I say seeds, I actually mean a broader category that include the, the reproductive organ of the plant, grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. What's interesting about seeds is that um, plants protect them. They're the reproductive organ of the plant. It's where the next generation is coming from. And so from an evolutionary perspective, a uh, Darwinian perspective, plants don't want herbivores or insects to come along and digest the seed because then it's not producing offspring. The, the tricky thing is that plants can't run away from predators, right? Mm. <laughs> right? The, um, so they tend to either use shells, um, which is nature's way of saying stay out, or toxin, naturally occurring toxins and pesticides. So in nature, in, in wild plants, a lot of seeds are poisonous um, or toxic if, if you eat too many of them. Mm. 
wild almonds have cyanide in them. Lots of different uh, uh, fruit pits and seeds have cyanide in them. Um, certain types of uh, red clover is a type of pasture legume that screws with the digestive system and reproductive system of cattle and sheep. So, um, so th what we have to realize with, with grains is that they, they sort of have an evolutionary interest in poisoning us. Mm -hmm. um, and, or at least they, they have um, historically. So eating large amounts of the same type of seed can be dangerous. Um, so, so we have to, if we're going to eat them, there are a few there are a few rules of thumb to make them healthier first um, you can domesticate them like with almonds you flip one gene and it stops produce, producing this cyanide like compound and then you actually have a healthy food um, historically hunter gatherers have either soaked or or cooked nuts and um, other seed like foods, um, which can leach out some of the problematic compounds. Uh, fermenting uh, mm -hmm. can do the same thing. Uh, cooking can, can do the same thing. And eating a diversity of different plant foods. So, so the, the evolutionary perspective on seeds is we basically didn't start eating large amounts of these seeds until the agricultural revolution about 10,000 years ago. And then suddenly we started eating tons and tons of the same few uh, cereal grains. That being like wheat and corn, wheat, soy. Yeah, wheat, soy's a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, corn was was new world. So, but in in the Middle East, it's I think it's wheat, barley, oats, um, and then you get rice more in the Far East. Um, and and it's funny each each grain. You take any grain, and if you look at people um, throughout history that have pretty much eaten that and nothing else peasant farmers and things like that. There are always these weird conditions that people get pellagra uh, with corn, um, berry berry with rice. Um, f basically, nutrient deficiencies from having a staple cereal grains in their diet. Mm. Um, so so that's, that's sort of the, the, big, the, the biggest evolutionary insight from... So where's the connection between that and that being a source of inflammation in the body. Well, the, um, so the gluten, take gluten, which is the main protein in wheat and some other, some other grains. Okay. Um, it, the, the nature of the protein is that it irritates, even in large quantities in particular, it irritates the lining of our stomach. Um, then our immune system um, responds to that inflammation um, and if, if some of the, those proteins make it into our bloodstream, leak through the stomach and make it, make it through, the, through the bloodstream, gut permeability, it's called, um, then, then the immune system latches onto that protein and says, here's a foreign invader, and it attacks that protein in the mm -hmm. tissues around it. Um, and we're realizing how important gut health is to all sorts of to health throughout the body. So if if you have a persist if if you have persistent inflammation and a damaged stomach, it can lead to mental disorders. Celiacs way overrepresented among schizophrenics, um, hmm. people with depression, debilitating depression. Um, celiacs have there are much higher rates of different types of mental problems, um, and they're realizing that the gut and the brain are. If you, you have as, you have the, the as you have tons of neurons in your stomach that are directly tied. Yeah, and we were just, you know we were talking about this a little yeah. bit before we, we came on air today, and it's that's I think it's such a foreign notion to so many people, and I'm still sort of like piecing it together. You know, when you start to to think, okay, what I think, like everything from literally my ability to problem solve, to be in a good mood or yeah. in a horrible mood, to be you know like. You know, psychologically sound um, can be af affected in a pretty profound way by what's happening in my gut. Right. It seems so foreign. Mind and body. So many people. Like, how could how could inflammation in my gut or bugs? You know, how yeah. could the bacteria, the gut biome, 
affect how I'm thinking. It just seems like, I think so many people have, how do you buy that? Like, what's the connection there? You know, the, for some reason, maybe it's in the Western world more, people have set up this distinction between mind and body no. as if they're two different things. And they're not. We're clearly consciousness, cognitive processes um, takes place in the brain, but it's not as if the rest of the body is dumb, right? Um, so to some extent, it's an artificial distinction. Yeah. You, you, you were sharing two examples with me before about sort of like how um, critters in the, your gut, you know, like critters in your gut, basically, like oh, bacteria or parasites, can, I mean, literally change the way that you behave in a really radical way. Yeah, this is some of the coolest, <laughs> wildest stuff, and it's really freaky. When you look at how microorganisms can, can not just influence our health, but change how we think. So we were talking about Toxoplasma gondii, which has been written up over the last few years. It, it's, a, it's a parasite that um, makes mice unafraid of cats. So mice are out there eating, eating cat feces. They get uh, eaten by the, the cat. The parasite lodges, um, it goes through the digestive system of the cat, comes out in its feces, infecting the mice that eat the feces. But it changes the brain chemistry of mice permanently to make them unafraid. And it's been implicated in schizophrenia. So a, 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 this isn't proven, but there's a lot of published papers thinking that Toxoplasma gondii plays a partially causal role in schizophrenia. Um, you know, that, that's pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, I mean, the notion that what you eat, which then ends up in your gut, can play a role in your psychological health yeah. or profile is pretty mind blowing. Yes. <laughs> right. It's not something that I think people, it's not something that is intuitively like, I'll just buy that. But I guess there's more and more research going on in this now, and uh, it's pretty eye opening stuff. So there was a study on flu influenza. S it was small, small study. I don't want to overhype it, but it, w it, it showed that students who were infected with flu, exposed to, to flu, um, became much more social and extroverted in about the 24 hours to 48 hours before the onset of symptoms. So the idea was that um, it's, it's possible that the pathogen was basically hijacking our behavior to help it spread. Because mm -hmm. you go to a party and, and, and you're exposing other people while you're there. We know that influenza and cold viruses, when they cause people to sneeze, that again is the pathogen hijacking our behavior for its own benefit. You know, you sneeze and you, you shoot all these particles, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully you cover your mouth, but you shoot it out at all these other people around you, which helps the, the pathogen spread. Yeah, and, and, and you had talked about also um, this, when, the thing about, um, was it gorillas? Gorillas. Where they change the diet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, these two gorillas uh, at the Cleveland Zoo, they changed the diet from uh, fiber bars, essentially, to leafy plants and vegetables. And one of their behavioral problems was that they would uh, pluck their hair um, all day long to the point where they had noticeable bald spots. And when they switched their diet, that behavior almost went away entirely. They still did a little bit, but... Not very right. much. Right, so it's almost like an obsessive compulsive psychology. Right. And which was largely reversed. And I guess I guess it's probably impossible to prove causation with something like that, but you have the correlation. It's like, okay, we changed the diet and all of a sudden the behavior goes away well, and to if, a large extent. If you or I are the one that has the issue with hair plucking or something else, it doesn't matter if you establish. Right. It's All like, why don't you just try it? Goes it. Away. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's like, and what's the what's the risk of trying eating? Yeah. You know, like pulling greens out or eating more greens or doing whatever it may be. Yeah. I mean, the risk is it doesn't work and you had a little bit more green in your diet for right. a while. Well, and, and to finish off the gorilla story, I then heard of a woman, I believe in Texas, who shifted to eating paleo and, and through removing, I don't know whether she pinpointed it, if it was gluten or not, but she had a hair plucking uh, OCD disorder. And, uh, and it went away entirely when, when she changed her diet. Mm. And, and that's, you know, that's debilitating. That's who you are. That's, uh, you know, 
how you look and and how other people perceive you that. and to realize that something that you probably think is normal or or something that you're going to have to live with for the rest of your life can be altered by how you eat yeah i mean it, it is fascinating and i think that's where the big the big leap is for a lot of people it's like i think if you tell a lot of people okay the way you eat the way you move your body the way you sort of like build your habitat can have a profound effect on the classical signs of health you know, right. like disease prevention and this stuff and more energy all right, I can buy that. Yeah. Maybe we can debate about like what those things are, like how to do it right or wrong under each one of those categories. But I think one of the big leaps is, you know, like, yeah, what I'm putting into my stomach, it may change my behavior in a pretty profound way and then have a huge social effect on, on my life. Yeah. Um, well, but, and, and one of the things I, I say is a lot of people have conditions they don't talk about at cocktail parties. Hmm. And, 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 and so people sort of har harbor these issues and internalize them and, and learn to cope with them. But it doesn't, it, you know, for those people, why not experiment and try and see if, see if you can address it through some lifestyle yeah. changes. And I think that's a lot of, you know, which kind of circles us around to like another big part of who you are, which is it's sort of the ethic of the hacker or the biohacker, yeah, right. Which is fundamentally, I mean, do you self-identify as like I'm a biohacker? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, so you know, so and and for those who don't know, I mean, there's a substantial and growing community around the world that essentially say I'm I'm going to quantify a lot of the way that I live my life. You know, like the things that I that I do and the things that I eat and the things that I consume, and then as much as I can measure yeah. what the effect is, so that I can figure out how can I change like the way I'm interacting with the world and, and to optimize the way that I exist in the world, to feel better, to do better, to perform better, to whatever it may be. Um, and, and I guess the question is, for some people it may seem obsessive, right? right? But for other people, if you've got, like, like you said, I guarantee every person at a cocktail party, I'm going to one tonight, Yeah, right? There's something that they're not telling anybody else. In Nobody's going to bring up their with. irritable bowel syndrome. Right, exactly. The, actually, know? one guy did. But that was... <laughs> but, but, you know... The, so if you're if you're somebody where there's something going on with you, and the medication like you don't want to be on meds, meds for the rest of your life, even if they're working to a certain extent, because there may be other stuff going on, or it's just not working, or yeah. the traditional stuff isn't working, you know. At what point do you get to a point where you're like, you know what? Let me quantify a bit more. Let me get a little bit more, you know, like really write this stuff down, and just do the you know potentially fair amount of work right. to really start to analyze what's coming in and what the effect is. And, and it may be for a fairly short period of time, but if I can figure it out, not by reading the research or listening, reading the magazines and all this stuff, but by creating me as an experiment of one, I right. don't really care about all the other experiments. Right. And everybody is different. Right. I, I find this to be extremely liberating because I don't have to go to people and say, well, this is paleo's one sits size fits all we must all eat the exact same list of foods and yeah. you know in, in the same amounts and uh, you, the end the end point is you have to create your own diet you have to create your own habitat your own lifestyle that you are going to live in you're a unique person you have a, a unique genome uh, you have your own gut microbiome you have your own tastes and preferences and injuries and allergies so each one of us is a unique organism living in a unique habitat, and and hacking can you know help you help you diagnose what the issue might be, and then the real challenge, and we sort of touched on this before, is knowing what to do and then doing it. The real challenge is then, in in part, is motivating yourself to actually follow through and right. make a change. And and sadly, I think what motivates a lot of people is they get to a point of such high level of pain or disease or unease that they're just like, okay, something has to change. Right. You know, and I think that's one of the challenges of human nature is that we tend to wait until we hit that point to really take action or action on the level that would make a real difference. And then I think the, the bigger challenge is that then we do it, but once the pain goes away and it's far enough in the background we stop doing the things that made it go away. We re revert to the right. behaviors. Right. Um, it's hard, and I see that myself. I mean, I don't, I don't, I know what I think I should be doing, 
you know, and, yeah. and I know all that stuff, but I'm still out there drinking way more alcohol than I should, which doesn't just interrupt my sleep. It destroys my gut bacteria. And, uh, you know, so it, um, yeah, that's, it's a huge challenge. I think it's one of the big ones that I don't have an answer for. Yeah. Um, I was taught one of the first conversations that we had with this, with this show was with Dan Ariely. And, you know, Dan was burned on 80% of his body when he was 18 years old. Right. And he was in the hospital for three years, you know, and he's, he has been through the, you know, really, really horrible pain for an extended period of time. And, um, and he's got a visual reminder every single day of his life, you know, all over his body of what his 10 on the pain scale is. Yeah. And, you know, so we had, I was talking to him about this idea of compliance with health behavior, you know, and he was saying, you know, like he has a very visual Every single day he can see what the worst is for him, you know, but if you have a heart attack, you know, and you go through rehab and then a year down the road, you can't see right. it anymore. It, like we, you don't have that prompt and human nature is so primal right. that it's like we need some sort of visceral prompt to keep behaving in a certain way. Well, so, so this is an important theme in my book is how do, how do you motivate yeah. people? and. So one, one thing that I think we should be tapping into more is religion. When you, when, you look at, um, when you look at the history of religion, a lot of religions have had a functional health purpose to them. Mm -hmm. So in, right. in Judaism and early religions, hand washing right. and bathing. Well, that, that was a functional health benefit yeah. from, from that type, type of lifestyle. So fasting more people are experimenting with fasting or intermittent fasting of different types and i just tell people look there are fasting traditions in every religious and spiritual tradition around the world whatever whichever one you like pick one and follow those fasting traditions you know if if it's yom kippur and you're jewish or uh, you want to fast during periods of lent and and you're catholic or greek orthodox has all sorts of uh, fasting traditions it amounts to veganism plus shellfish uh, mm -hmm. celib and celibacy for, I think, about a third of the year. Um, but that can be a source of meaning and motivation that yeah. is more than just health benefits. Yeah, and, and I think one of the big things there is you've got, okay, somebody has created the law for us that we have to follow, right? So it's like, I'm, I'm surrendering to this is the path, yes. which we, we like. Yeah. Right. And tell, just tell me what to do. Right. Just tell me what to do. Yeah, but I think there are other, two other really important things there. One is ritual. Yeah. We are like massively drawn to ritual. And if we can do something long enough um, where it becomes how it becomes ritual, the likelihood of us continuing to do it, you know, it goes through the roof. Yeah. But then I think the third thing, which is really important, and I, to me, this may be the biggest power of, of, of religion in turn, like in this context, is the simple fact that you become part of a community, right? And so the, the social context of we're all doing this together, we're all following the same rules, we all support each other, and if I do this, I'm not abnormal. Right. <laughs> you know, so this is the behavior that we all follow, and we support each other in following this behavior. It's massive, it's well, huge. And so to tie religion to, to this, take CrossFit. CrossFit yeah. has been described as a cult. Right. <laughs> and my perspective is, Bring on the cults. This country needs, this world needs more fitness right. cults. If it's, right, if, it's a, if you're bringing people together around the behavior that's, you know, like empowering on some level, you know, yeah. and we can have a debate about whether the actual CrossFit modality sure. is like good or right. bad. That's, yeah. that's not the, the idea is anything, like if you're building a cult around positive behavior yeah. that empowers autonomy, that empowers health, empowers vitality, Okay. <laughs> yeah. If, if your problem is that people are so interested in working out that occasionally they overdo it, that is a that's a high class problem. Yeah. And I mean, and you and I have jams separately on this. You yeah. know, like the the sad fact is, at least in the United States, that for the better part of thirty years, eighty to eighty five percent of adults will not join or stay members of health clubs. At the same time, more than ninety percent of those people will raise their hand and say, "Hell yeah." I need to be exercising, moving my body right. on a regular basis to live the way I want to live. It's just like massive disconnect. Right. Right. And you look at the, the way that it's being provided, you know, and it's so clear that there is, well, A, from any entrepreneurs out there that want to actually build something, yeah. <laughs> there's like crazy opportunity in that space. But, but even more to have a societal impact, to actually create 
provide solutions, experiences that get people moving on a regular basis that actually do it in a way that people want to do. Yeah. It's not that hard. Social part is a huge part of it, and CrossFit has nailed that. Totally. Um, and it's, and it's, it's tapping into timeless motivations. Yeah. Human nature. It, yeah. If you understand human nature, and there are lots of different facets of it, so there are lots of different, CrossFit's not the only, they don't have a monopoly on right. human yeah, nature. Exactly. But if uh, they effectively tap into um, a, a sport-like, war-like uh, camaraderie and competition um, among a core of people. Um, uh, having your name up on the board, you're not anonymous. You are known in your community. You have a reputation to defend. Right. Um, that's an important dynamic, fu you know, functional dynamic. Um, competing against yourself and others. Competition motivates a lot of people. It doesn't motivate right. everyone, but yeah. But I think, but you just nailed it though when you say competing against yourself and others because you have that choice there. Yeah. You know, so like in CrossFit, it's really more about you competing against, I mean, at a certain level, you're competing against others when you get into all the like, the right. but fundamentally on a small, like you're in your box in your town, you know, and everybody else who's there with you, you're, you know, they're motivated. Each person wants you to do better than your last best performance. Right. And that I think is huge because I think it, people find it much easier to lean on social support to beat their own best rather than to try and beat everybody else in the group because yeah. then it becomes a zero sum game. Right. Whereas instead, no, everybody can win. Yeah. You know, and that's so empowering and it's it doesn't exist in most of the solutions provided in the mainstream health yeah. and fitness world for adults. As for kids, that's all it is. I mean, we all worked out all the time when we were kids. We called it play. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. Right? And we wanted to do more and more of it until like we actually dropped, you know, as soon as we walked and, in the house, we had nothing left. And kids don't need machines to play. They right. don't even know how to use a treadmill. What is this for? Right. And if you and so it's funny, you think you think to yourself, if I put a kid on a treadmill, like five seconds later they'll they'll be bored out of their mind. <laughs> they'll wander off they'll the, want, or they'll be but, hanging off the side. But as adults, we're supposed to be okay there. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden and no. You know, the, the same thing that the, the mass rep, we're not geared for repetition. Right. You know, it's just we experience that as massively boring and massively painful. You know, whereas when you're a kid, like what defines the movement is constantly novel, constantly changing. Right. And, you do, and the nature of the activity demands intense focus. That's right. Because it's huge. Because if you're not training some sort of skill, your brain isn't engaged. Right. Like, for, so, I think about some of the physical activities that I've gotten very obsessive over in in my life, and some of them are as simple as skee ball or the free throw <laughs> machine at like a video game arcade. You know, I could, if I had unlimited tokens, I would sit there all day long right. trying to beat my top. I just talked to my wife about skee ball. <laughs> She'll take you down. Uh, well, we'll just have to see about that. Um, but. Why is there not something in the gym that I can go in and test accuracy and coordination and score against myself right. and just keep doing it and have it have some physical component where I'm training balance, accuracy, coordination, all right. those things? Why is that not in there? Yeah, and, and when you see places that pop up that are built around that, they explode. Yeah. You know? Um, anyway, we could go yeah, off we, on this. <laughs> This big and we have actually. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, so let's kind of rein it in a little yeah. bit. Um, and I, but I think the big idea here is really that movement matters and movement connected to ritual and social support. Yeah. Huge. And if you want to, and, and not just for movement, but if you want to actually comply, if you want to actually make that leap from being able to sustain some new behavior or a set of behaviors for a long period of time, like finding that tribe, that sense of belonging built built around those behaviors. It's not mandatory. There's some people that do it without, right. but it can become a huge benefit in being able to sustain them long term, long enough to become habit and ritual, and then it becomes more internalized. Completely. Um, and finding also ways, I think, to enjoy the actual the food, the activity, whatever it may be. Right. In and of itself. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting because we're having this conversation, right? And you're not entirely coming out of, but you're kind of like on the the down slope of launching this book, massive media tour. Yeah going all over the place, um, traveling like crazy. And now it sounds like settling back a little bit more in your New York digs. And, and like you shared when, earlier in the conversation, this has been one of those windows 
where it's, it's so disruptive to your normal schedule to what you normally do that some of those rituals and some of those behaviors that mm -hmm. you really you live and breathe and normally really buy into become massively hard yeah. to keep going on the road as you come back to this because a lot of people go through this we go through these intense spurts you know and then we never come back to those behaviors so as as you're kind of like starting to hit the downslope and getting more ability to, to come back to them um, what's sort of what's your approach to trying to slide back into that groove again um, well it's 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 simple things it's I enjoy I, you know I enjoy I have a nice knife chef's knife and a wooden cutting board and that actually relaxes me to use that and and to cook food mm -hmm. um, and so so getting back into into some of those it's hard to get back into those rituals, but a lot of it I've found is a, just about who you surround yourself with. Mm -hmm. You know, other other people in my apartment cook, so it's easier to get back into cooking. Right. Um, you know, if you're dating someone or married to someone who has a similar life course or interests, it's so much easier to get back into into how you do it. So that probably my biggest my biggest realization as I get back into this is the importance of the people that you surround yourself with. Because if your friends are doing these things, if your spouse or lover or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever is also going to the gym, there's it, there's it's like a safety, a social safety right, net yeah. that gets you back. Yeah, and I think you br you bring up also a really important point as we, we kind of start to come full circle with our conversation, which is that. We've talked about that social support is a way to help you with your behaviors, but th there's a flip side to the social aspect of living your life in a very deliberate, health-oriented way like this, which is that socially it may be really hard to do. Yeah, you know, not forget about the behavior and just in terms of fitting into a particular social environment. You know, like when you're out with friends, you're like, no, I don't drink, I don't do gluten, I don't do dairy, I don't do soy, I don't do this. I'll just you know like grab some celery. Right. <laughs> Right. And th so people, I think, are, struggle with the potential social ostracization yeah. of that. And whether you're vegan or paleo or right. anything like that, people, people know what it's like to be out. The social situations are by far the hardest. Alcohol, for me, is, is the most difficult mm. issue because I'm out. Once I started promoting my book, I was frequently out five nights a week, either meeting with people or putting on events and things like that. Right. And uh, so it, it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah, and I, and I guess, the, so what do you do? I mean. <laughs> you have to, um, you have to walk the line of, of, of finding a way to figure out what's essential and what's not. So if I know that um, I don't have any flex on, say, gluten, but I do have some a little bit of flex on alcohol. Well, what I do with alcohol is I have low sugar, gluten free options, and I try to keep it under three drinks. And I'm not always successful at that. In fact, I'm frequently unsuccessful. Um, I'm not sure I have a, a good answer. Yeah. It, sometimes you just have to have you you have to make it part of your identity. It says, this is the type of person that I am, right. and I'll go out and I'll be social. Um, but I also bend the rules. The, 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 when I bend the rules, it's usually in social situations where I prioritize my social relationships with other people more than my own personal health. Nah. And, I, and I, I wonder, I think what, what may happen there, at least with me, I'm curious if you feel this too, is that... It's not so much what I'm concerned about me, but I, you almost feel like if you're saying, I do this, 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 and this, right? And then the people around you are pounding, you know, like all this other stuff that you're concerned that you feel like, like you're standing there in judgment of them. Right. And they, they start to feel really weird right. about what they're doing. And you just don't want to create that dynamic. Yeah. You know, so you almost, 
are tempted to back down from your beliefs because you don't want to feel like you're judging them. Right, or like you're, you're, the, them per, feel you're weird. the one person and they're the group. Yeah. It's, it's at, the, at the beginning of any of these changes, it's really hard for the early adopters. It's, yeah. very, it's very difficult. Um, and it doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be paleo. It could, it could just be a, an alcoholic that, that could never have a drink but wanting to be in social situations, right. it's extremely, extremely difficult. And it's the power of normal. You know, what everybody is doing, momentum of society and momentum of beliefs yeah. is an enormous, enormous force. Yeah, which is why I think when we surround ourselves with people with that same behavior set and same belief, we feel much more comfortable. And it's always those like bursts where we have to exist for a chunk of time outside of that. That's always the big challenge yeah. and like handling that. Um, I don't think there's really an easy answer to it. I think you do the best that you can um, and kind of figure it out um, as you go. Yeah. So um, the name of this project is Good Life Project. Um, so when I offer that term out to you, like to live a good life, what does that mean to you? What comes out of it? I, I think that happiness is a little bit overrated. And a lot of people, when you take an evolutionary look at our emotions, our emotions did not evolve to be, a lot of them did not evolve to be permanent states of being. And so I don't view this notion that you can be in a state of happiness consistently over a long duration, I think is a little bit of a fool's errand, mm -hmm. that it's hard to do that. Um, I, in, in my own life, it's what I focus on is a combination of accomplishments, Accomplishment and personal relationships, and uh, and sometimes those are mutually <laughs> exclusive. Um, no, but I, I I think a good life is one where where you focus on achieving something, and and that could be building a company, it could be raising a child, it could be it could be um, you know cooking delicious, amazing food. It could be your career. Um, so I I think. Accomplishment is important, and but accomplishment often means being unhappy for periods of time. But um, and then and then in social relationships, I think is a, is a pretty straightforward one that nobody would disagree with. But um, you know, I'm 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 at my best when I have a core group of friends around me and things like that. So. I, I, I tend to think that a, that a good life is, is more the, when I, was, when I was in college, and I think a lot of people do this, is they get very philosophical and try to find, you know, the, the Buddha sitting cross-legged on the hill somewhere mm -hmm. that there's a meaning of life out there. And I've, when I thought the most about that, I tended to, I felt like I overthought life and I've sort of scaled back and I just try to, I don't try to necessarily stay in the moment all the time, but I do find that it's a lot of rituals and routines of being around people that can routinely make you laugh um, is far more important than finding some, some grand meaning of life. So, yeah, like that. Yeah. Awesome. Great conversation. I loved yeah. it. Thank you. So I'm Jonathan Fields. My guest today has been John Durant, author of The Paleo Manifesto, signing off for Good Life Project. Mm -hmm.